Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, Health Junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Today, we're going to be talking all about blood sugar issues and how elevated blood sugar causes heart disease and cardiovascular disease. So what I'm talking about here is how blood sugar being elevated for significant amounts of time can actually cause placking in your arteries and cause those arteries to clog up with cholesterol. Now, it's not something that happens overnight, it does take time, but the fast-paced lifestyle that we have as Americans can provoke this. And it's a big deal because I'm seeing it every single day in my office, and it's not just uh, older folks. I'm talking young folks, folks that are in their 30s, 40s, 20s even. I'm starting to see patterns where the blood sugar is going up and you know, conventional docs are not paying attention to, you know, if the blood sugar is a little bit elevated on a general test, they're not taking a look at further at their hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month time frame, you know, evaluation via the blood that tells us, does this individual balance their blood sugar well um, day in, day out because of, of fasting blood glucose just shows us what's happening in that moment. So there's a lot of things that are happening with society now that we can be investigating further and catching these imbalances sooner. Now, another thing you could do would be to make sure that you're preventing this from ever happening whatsoever. And so I'm going to talk about that today. Now, usually we think about blood sugar imbalances being directly to, you know, related to someone eating candy all the time. That is not the case. Folks who are pre-diabetic, diabetic, it's not, they didn't get that because 100% because they just sat munching around candy all the time. There are multiple factors. The amount of carbohydrates that you intake, so processed carbs like pretzels, crackers, breads, those affect your blood sugar too. These are carbohydrates. How many potatoes you eat can also affect your blood sugar. Corn can affect your blood sugar. So. It's not just sitting around and eating candy. The interesting component here though is our American lifestyle of being stressed does provoke us to want to eat junk food. And sometimes people have a sweet tooth, maybe they like the pastries, or sometimes someone might have more of a craving for chips and like that salty stuff. Well, either way, that stress coping mechanism of what our body's asking for, and, and the reason it's asking for carbs is because it wants energy. It's not getting the nutrients into the bloodstream that it wants. Well, what's happening with that coping mechanism is that we go and eat these things in large amounts because a lot of us when we're stressed, um, we stress eat, or we're too lazy to make a meal. It's easier to rip open a bag and stick your hand in and eat that particular item. And well, guess what happens? Over time, that indulgence in those snacks and those carb cravings end up causing our blood sugar to go up. The more the blood sugar goes up, those molecules of glucose not getting into your cells, well, they get turned to fat for one, but they also can scrape up your arterial walls. And those glucose molecules that scrape the arterial walls, anytime we scrape the side of an artery, we now have the ability for molecules to get into the lining of the bloodstream. And that's not good. We don't want that to happen. That is a bad thing. And so we need to work on reversing our American lifestyle. We need to make sure that our blood sugar is getting put in check. And really there's a lot of different things we can do to prevent heart disease, to prevent cardiovascular disease, to prevent our blood sugars from even getting way out of control. And it starts with lifestyle. Number one, stress management. Look at your life. See if you can put it in order. 
A lot of us are living in cluttered homes with a bunch of cluttered things all over the place, and that's stress in and of itself. But also we have cluttered schedules. We don't have organization. Spending a weekend to organize your life is so worth it. I can't tell you how worth it it is. I highly recommend getting a schedule, organizing yourself, making sure you're waking up and going to bed at the same time. Make sure that you have a routine. I have on my website, my routine planner and my guide. It's at drjkrausnd.com and it's on my resources tab. So if you're wanting some help with creating a routine, head on over there because that'll be a great place to start. Now, the other big thing that I'm seeing happening as we get older, we get stressed, we immediately the gym goes away, the movement goes away. We feel like we have to sit down and do everything, you know, in that certain moment. And now suddenly there's no time for exercise. There's no time for play. There's no time for really de-stressing yourself from your day. And this is a big deal. We need to move to help our body to, to lose, to not lose, but to use glucose because glucose in the bloodstream is our, is our fuel. And a lot of people are going to say, well, I'm really tired because yes, stress tires you out. Being stressed out is tiring, but you have to move. And I'm not talking like you have to run marathons. I'm talking just walking after meals, walking during the day, getting on an elliptical machine, getting on a bike, riding a bike, going out to the nearest playground and swinging, playing hopscotch, play, movement. It all helps with utilizing some of that excess glucose that's floating around in your bloodstream when you're stressed. Because cortisol, the stress hormone, that guy will also put your glucose up. How does it do that? Well, if you are trying to get away from a bear, you need some glucose, you need some fuel in your, your bloodstream to run away from that bear. Well, our bodies can't differentiate between real bears and fake bears. And all of our fake bears are all of our stressors in our life that our body thinks are going to get us. Another big, huge issue that I just read an article not too long ago in, in one of the magazines that I read is how scary movies and exposing yourself to um, movies that are thriller movies, action movies, shoot 'em up movies can actually get your cortisol pumping and raise your blood sugar. Well, what do most of us do when we go watch movies? We eat popcorn. Maybe we're eating a bowl of ice cream. We're usually eating something that is carb rich that's also going to put up our blood sugar in addition to that darn TV show or movie amping up your blood sugar. So I work with a lot of folks who are pre-diabetic, diabetic, or we've just figured out that their blood sugar is just starting to become out of balance. And the number one thing that I like to ask a lot of my folks with blood sugar imbalances is what do you do before bed? What kind of TV shows do you like? What kind of things are you Netflixing? What kind of things are you YouTubing? These are important things to think about because the social media that you interact with or the TV shows that you interact with before you go to bed can have a huge impact on your blood sugar overnight. Let me explain. First, it depends, of course, on what you ate for dinner. If you busted open a bag of chips and that's what you had for dinner and called it good, or you had, you know, maybe had some leftover pie and you said, well, I'm just going to do a snack like that for dinner and call it good. And then you went and watched a scary thriller movie. And then you found yourself waking up at 3, 4 a.m. and you're hungry again. Or you're waking at 3, 4 a.m. and you can't go back to sleep. It's possible that what happened is you ate those carb-rich meals. Then you watched that scary movie to put your cortisol up, which cortisol, anytime your cortisol, that's your fight or flight hormone, anytime that goes up, your blood sugar goes up. So pair that with eating some sweet treats and carbs. And then a couple hours later, that's going to come crashing down pretty fast. And that's in the average person. And someone who is diabetic, that's going to stay prolonged, elevated for a little while, and then crash. This is dangerous because that crash can dive pretty low. And oftentimes we'll wake up when our blood sugar does go down. And for some people, we're waking up because 
we need to eat something. Our body's saying, I need food right now. So if you have a habit of waking up in the middle of the night and needing to eat, you've got some serious blood sugar imbalances. But if you're not waking up in the middle of the night to eat, but you're waking up, it's possible that you've got some issues going on with that cortisol bringing your blood sugar up and that cortisol staying elevated overnight. Cortisol naturally rises in the morning and goes down at night to put us in bed. But if you're having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, you really want to consider that there might be a cortisol and a blood sugar issue, which leads me back to diet and lifestyle factors. The stressed American lifestyle doesn't really allow us to sit down and make a proper breakfast. Most of us are eating on the run. A lot of times it can be you know, a quick muffin, a donut, piece of toast, energy bar. Maybe it is your Starbucks triple venti latte. I would be very curious to see some data in terms of when Starbucks really took off and their sweet drinks. I would like to see how much diabetes and cardiovascular disease increased with the advent of Starbucks. Because I do truly believe um, that unfortunately... We are fueling our fatigue with coffee, but we're also fueling our sweet tooths with some of these sweet sugary drinks. And for those of you who don't do those drinks, what are you putting in your coffee? Are you putting sugar in your coffee? Well, caffeine raises cortisol levels. Your blood sugars are going to go up with that coffee. Then you add in some more sugar to it. Boom, you're going to have more, more issues. And then what happens after that coffee? Well, you've got some energy for a while. And then when that energy comes down and your cortisol comes down and your blood sugar comes down, you crash. It's no wonder that most of us are tired somewhere after lunch or between that two and four o'clock time frame because it's naturally when cortisol is on its downward slope, but it's also when we're coming down off of a lot of our sugar highs that we've started mid-morning or even with breakfast. So here's another interesting thing to think about. Yes, the American lifestyle does provoke us to eat pure carb breakfast. Like even if you grab a banana and you're like, I've got my banana, I'm good, I'm good to go, I'm eating fruit. Well, it still raises your blood sugar. Most of us have pretty high cortisol in the morning because we're running, we're getting ready to go. And naturally it's high because it wakes us up, but we boost it a lot higher because we are rushing, we're running late because we're not organized, we're trying to get to work on time. You name the factors. Maybe you have to sit in traffic. Who knows? Whatever it may be, you've got some stressors. Maybe you got to get all the kids to school. You've got to get everyone to where they need to be. I mean, moms are like, you know, traffic directors in the morning. You go here. You do this. Go this. Do that. I mean, that's a lot of work. And that, you know, if you're running on, you know, the commercial America runs on Dunkin'. If you're running on Dunkin' with your donut and your coffee chances are you're setting yourself up for some heart issues, your cardiovascular issues, and your blood sugar being all over the place. And then you wonder why you're tired halfway through the day. So let's talk a little bit about why that tiredness happens. A lot of us will have a morning rush of cortisol to get us going, and we'll eat our sugary snack. Maybe we'll eat granola and yogurt. By the way, not healthy. It is not Why? Because granola has a ton of sugar in it. And if you're eating yogurt, yogurt has carbs. Naturally, milk has carbs in it. You add the granola to the yogurt, now you've got a bunch of carbs. Top that off with your cortisol being high in the morning. Your blood sugar is going high. What happens? Well, your pancreas has to adjust to that. And what it's got to do is it's got to release insulin. Insulin goes into your bloodstream. The insulin grabs the glucose, so the blood sugar molecules. And and by the way, carbohydrates break down to glucose in your bloodstream. And glucose is the simplest sugar molecule. And insulin grabs it and pulls it into cells for energy. Well, your pancreas is going to base how much insulin it releases off of the meal before the meal you're currently having. So if you have a banana for breakfast or you have your venti soy latte, um, with all kinds of sugar in it and extra whipped cream. Now, what's going to happen is your blood sugar is going to go way up. And then by the time you get to lunch, that blood sugar is going to be going on its downward drop. Then you're going to be like, well, I'm going to be healthy for lunch. I'm going to eat like a piece of salmon or tuna and a salad. Well, what's going to happen? Well, your pancreas is going to think that you're going to have that banana and your soy latte. Guess what? Your pancreas is going to release too much insulin 
And then your body's going to take what glucose it has in the bloodstream from your tuna or salmon salad, which isn't going to be a lot of carbohydrate in that meal. And you're going to get super tired after that meal because you're going to take your blood sugar downward. So what is one to do? The best way to eat is really eat dinner foods for breakfast and eat breakfast foods for dinner. Now that might sound really crazy, but the concept is this. I am not a huge fan of, of no carb diets. I think that we need some carbohydrates. I think it's just individual based on the person. I think you need to play with it a little bit to see where your blood sugar is at. And truly, if you do, if you are pre-diabetic or if you are diabetic, you need to be testing two hours after each of your meals and you need to test first thing in the morning, no matter what, to know where is your blood sugar so you can figure out what meals do well with you and what ones don't. So let me give you an explanation of what I do with patients. I have them testing four times a day. So breakfast, half hour after lunch, half, or sorry, not a half hour, breakfast, so right when they wake up, before they even put a bite of food in their mouth, that's when I want some blood sugar. Then I'll do two hours after breakfast, two hours after lunch, and two hours after dinner. That gives me all of the information I need to know where things are at so that I can adjust from there. Now, after we have that and we have that data, we know how certain foods affect you. The most important thing to be thinking about in this case is in the morning, if you're stressed, if you're running, you're on the go, you really need to do some meal planning. And by that, making time to prep your meals, making sure you have protein, making sure you have good fat, making sure you have a little bit of carbohydrate in the form of a veggie or a fruit for breakfast and lunch, and then having more of your grain, your potato, your sweet potato in the evening. Because the more carb you have in the evening, the more you can stabilize blood sugars overnight. Because one of the big things I find with my folks who are pre-diabetic in particular, they struggle to balance blood sugar overnight because if they eat no carb or keto-based diet, oftentimes the body will naturally release some glucose from the muscles or liver overnight and elevate that blood sugar. And, and that happens naturally. Um, that's how we balance our blood sugar overnight is that our body will take some glucose out of the muscles, out of the liver, and put it into our bloodstream. But if you've been on a roller coaster all day with your blood sugars up and down and up and down, well, then things get a little confused overnight. And so I do recommend for folks to have a little bit of carbohydrate and to not be eating so dang late right before they go to bed. Because what I've found is that if you cut off dinner by about 5, um, 6 p.m. And, and stop eating, making sure you're not eating after 7 p.m., you will notice that you have time to move a little bit more before you go to bed. And then that's going to also help with regulating blood sugar overnight. So that leads me into my next big thing here, the the nighttime exercise or the daytime exercise. What time is best to exercise? Well, honestly, studies show for anyone who's stressed, which is pretty much most of the American population for that matter, uh, most of the world for that matter, really, we're stressed. And if we work out first thing in the morning, it can sometimes be kind of hard on the body, but sometimes that's the only way we can burn off that cortisol. And it's the only way we can get to the gym. In a perfect world, research has shown working out around 10 o'clock in the morning is the most ideal time, just FYI. I have to work out early in the morning at about 6.30 in the morning because that's how my schedule works and I can't do it any later because I'm tired after work, but I'm also getting out of work at like 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. So I find that folks just need to do some type of movement throughout the day. And the big thing is when I'm working with folks to get their blood sugar in check and prevent cardiovascular disease, the biggie is that we are 
walking, we're moving at least 30 minutes a day, not sitting down every, you know, a, a whole eight hour shift. I want folks getting up every hour just to move, just to like move their back, move their wiggle, whatever you need to do, walk around the office a little bit. It does make a difference. The other big thing that I've found making a huge difference for folks with blood sugar is taking an evening walk after dinner. It's something that has to do with stress relief, but it also has to do with winding down from the day. And it also, I truly believe, has to do with that balancing the blood sugar in the evening so that you go into your evening really rested. Now, not really rested, really balanced. Now, a lot of people have to work out after work. And that's okay. It's just a matter of fueling properly after you work out. And so it's really going back to you need some carbs after your workout. Don't be afraid of carbs if you have blood sugar imbalances. It's just finding out what dosages, what amounts work for you. That's why testing your blood sugar is key. There are also some things you can do naturally in terms of herbs and supplements to help you with blood sugar balance. One of the biggies is called berberine. It is an extract from Oregon grapefruit. It could also be an extract from golden seal. Berberines are a type of constituent, so a type of, quote, plant chemical that helps us to lower our blood sugar. And it also helps balancing gut bugs as well. I use berberines often with my folks who have elevated blood sugar, and I use it before I use metformin. It's a, metformin is a blood sugar lowering medication, but I find that truly berberines might work, if not better, um, definitely equivalent or if not better than metformin. And 1,500 milligrams before bed is what it, the dosage is that I have people trying out. Now, berberines can be kind of hard on the gut. It's something to think about because, let's face it, berberines are working to adjust your gut bug balance. And so I like them because they can also help with balancing your cholesterol. So they're also a cholesterol lowering agent. And this is longstanding research because if you can get your blood sugar down, you are going to be able to not plaque in your arteries so much so you're going to have less clogged arteries. So big thing to think about here. Another biggie is not having the inflammation start in the first place. And so I use turmeric, um, a liposomal based type of turmeric from a company called Thorn. The product's called Mariva. And you take one of those a day with your berberines and that's how I have folks working with blood sugar. I also have folks taking magnesium as well because magnesium helps to get glucose into the bloodstream. It helps it be more effectively uptake. Up, uptake, that is not a word, but more effectively taken into the cell. So, so really, magnesium helps our cells to utilize glucose for energy. So a lot of us are magnesium deficient. I recommend anybody with blood sugar issues to definitely get some magnesium in. The ideal dosage is somewhere between 500 and 800 milligrams for this case. Magnesium for muscle pain, between 800 and 1,000 milligrams. And magnesium glycinate is what I use for muscle pain. And magnesium malate is what I typically will use if we're dealing with blood sugar issues. So something to think about there. By the way, I will have all of these notes in my resources on my website at drjkrausnd.com, and it's actually in my show notes. So if you go to my podcast notes on my website, you will find these dosages written down there. I also highly recommend a beneficial bacteria. So my favorite these days that I've been working with for folks with blood sugar imbalances is Megaspore. It is a great company. They've got great probiotics and I typically will have someone taking a probiotic with breakfast or lunch, depending on what's easiest for their lifestyle. But that helps big time to keep the gut bugs balance because there's a big thing with gut bugs and your blood sugar as well because your gut bugs talk to you. They can request that you eat certain things and the more yeast that you have in your digestive system, the more that you will crave sugars and carbs. And if you can weed those guys out a little, that can also help with blood sugar balance. There's lots of research on the gut microbiome and it is related to blood sugar imbalances, mood, and 
diabetes, pre-diabetes. So check that out. Now, the other biggie is keeping blood sugar balanced. You want to make sure you're eating every three to four hours. You want at least 20 to 30 grams of protein for breakfast. You want some good fat. So avocado, raw nuts or toasted nuts or seeds, dry nuts or seeds, dry roast is what I mean. Um, nut butters, those kind of things are great for you to help with the blood sugar balance. Um, I often like to have ground turkey or ground chicken with some zucchini, a little bit of onions and mushrooms, and that's a good like scramble breakfast for me. Sometimes I'll add eggs to it, sometimes not. I wouldn't be afraid of eggs if you have issues with cholesterol. It's just a matter of how many eggs you're doing. I mean, if you're if you're eating like six eggs a day, that could be a problem. But if you're spreading it out over time, it's not the end of the world. I like folks to switch up their meals. So sometimes I'll do a meat scramble. Sometimes I will have eggs in the morning, a little bit of olive oil or, or grass-fed butter to saute things in. Now you've got a little bit more good fat. And boom, you're, you're ready to go. And oftentimes for lunch, I will do something like that. Or I will do my famous green smoothies. Right now I'm on a mega kick of uh, uh, doing cucumber rhubarb and romaine lettuce for some reason that seems to just do it for me along with some protein powder and i use a product called St stronger faster healthier for the protein powder it's a whey protein and it's one of the cleanest whey proteins out there because it is using um, milk from a grade a to cow so it's it's clean stuff stronger faster healthier is sfh.com check them out they're a pro they're a company out of maine but i like their products to help with keeping my blood sugar balance and for a protein hit in the middle of the day and so yeah that's my that's my middle of the day snack and i'll often add some nut butter RX Bar Company has these nut butters that are pretty good. They have a little bit of egg white in there for a little added protein as well. So something to consider. RX Bar's nut butters, I'll have a link to those guys so you can see what I'm talking about in my show notes. And so that's kind of my lunch. And then oftentimes for dinner, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have either some carrots. I'm going to have maybe a sweet potato. I'm going to use a medium-sized one. And I may also have... A, a grain such as quinoa or rice, something of that nature, and combine it with my veggies and another meat, if I do meat or fish, just depending on, on what it may be. Now, if you're vegan, if you're vegetarian, you can keep your blood sugar in check. You just have to make sure you're working on sufficient amounts of proteins. And sometimes you might need to rely on a little pea protein, or sometimes you might need to rely on a little lentils or things of that nature. So just you know, evaluate what you're doing and and start testing your blood sugar two hours after every meal. I think it's absolutely key. And, and that way you can kind of know how foods affect you. Some foods might be a slower rise in blood sugar up to four hours afterwards. Alcohol in particular takes a slower rise. Just so you know, stevia, it, it's not supposed to elevate your blood sugar, but I do see some issues with stevia. So just be careful to not be dumping stevia and, and the artificial sweeteners all over stuff because it is a mind trick. And I do think that there are some, some downfalls there. I even have a whole podcast dedicated to sweeteners and I also have a blog post written. So head over to my website if you want to look more up on those. So I've given you my breakdown in terms of what I do with folks in terms of supplements, in terms of um, diet. Now, the other big thing is dark leafy vegetables and, and lower carb vegetables. So romaine lettuce, cucumber, celery, mushrooms. These guys, I have people hitting up big time. In fact, six to eight cups of, of veggies a day is what I recommend to folks. And I'm not talking about sweet potato. I'm not talking about potato. I'm not talking about corn. I'm talking about your lighter veggies, like the cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, bok choy family kind of stuff. Lighter veggies. Because six to eight cups can really make a huge difference in the amount of antioxidants, but also the amount of good food for your gut bugs. So keep that in mind. 
Now, if you're having blood sugar issues and you're wondering what can I do with fruit, you know, really berries are great. Green apples are great. They don't have a huge impact on um, blood sugar overall. You definitely want to watch portion, one piece or one cup max. I tend to do my fruit either in my afternoon snack or I will have the fruit in with dinner if I don't have a grain. The idea here is not having grain and fruit. That's a problem. That's too much carb. But considering picking one, whatever you want to do, that's a great way to go about it. Now, the other biggie is exercise. I mentioned about 30 minutes of cardio five days a week. You need some cardio in terms of movement. Now, I'm not talking old school cardio where you get on your your <laughs> um, elliptical machine and you bring out your magazine or you take your phone and you scroll through your phone while you're moving on the elliptical. That doesn't really do a lot for you. Really, walking is one of the best ones because it changes terrain. You can go uphill. You can go downhill. You can speed up. You can slow down. I highly recommend interval-style cardio. Speed up, slow down, one minute fast, one 30 seconds slow, one minute fast, 30 seconds slow. It really makes a, a, a huge difference. The other big thing that makes a huge difference is weightlifting. Now, also not talking about powerlifting, I'm talking about just using some weights to help with overall strength because the more muscle you have, the more that you can burn your blood sugar off. Meaning, if your blood sugar goes high, you've got muscles to counter that. Same thing with movement. You're working with keeping your blood sugar in check because you're moving, you're requiring your body to use more of the glucose that's in the bloodstream. And that's a huge factor. And I think everyone should pay attention to that. Uh, in terms of how much you actually move during the day. Do an inventory on yourself. If you realize you're pretty sedentary most of the day, that's not a good thing. You need to start moving and at least get up once every hour and walk around for at least five minutes at your office. And then from there, getting in your cardio, whether it's walking, whether it's intervals, what, whatever, just some movement. And then considering doing a little bit of weightlifting. Maybe you're starting with machines. Maybe you're starting with some light free weights, whatever it may be. Go to your local gym, have a trainer help you, or there's tons of, of videos online. I love fitnessblender.com. They're one of the great uh, websites. They've been around around for a long time. They have free workouts. I highly recommend them because they just describe how to do things and how not to hurt yourself really well. So check them out. Now, the last thing here is stress management. And probably most people roll their eyes at this one, but it is a biggie. And breathing, I say over and over again in my podcast, five count inhales, seven count exhales, doing five of those like breakfast time when you wake up, morning time, and evening time before you go to bed at the minimum or anytime you feel stressed can be absolutely crucial for helping to keep your stress in check. I fully admit that I'm terrible at meditating and a lot of people are, but the cool part of this is breathing. We have to breathe. Why not breathe deeper and just focus on whatever you want to focus on, but try to count and breathe deeper, opening up your diaphragm, just really taking some good belly breaths. Absolutely huge. Organizing your life, absolutely huge. Getting a routine, getting a system helps with blood sugar management because you are not going to be stressed running around with high cortisol. Just You're just not if you've got an organization going on with your life. Now, the other biggie, which I want to reiterate before I sign off on this podcast, is that blood sugar causes cholesterol issues, so placking of your arteries. How does it do it? Because the more elevated that your blood sugar goes, the more we're going to have damage to the arteries and the easier it is for cholesterol to get in to those arterial linings and clog them up. That's how this connection happens. Now, the other big thing is that cholesterol goes up with stress just as much as blood sugar goes up with stress. And the more you can work with stress management, the more you can work with routines, the more you can work with exercise to burn off a little bit of that cortisol, the better you're going to be in the long run. So if you're wondering where I hid all of my resources from this podcast, they're in my show notes at drjkrausnd.com. Head on over to the podcast link and you'll see my notes right there for this episode. So if you're looking to find the products I recommended and the plan, it's all there. And this is what works day in, day out in my office for patients. I'm sharing this specific protocol because it works. And I want people to know that you don't have to be on metformin. You don't have to take the blood sugar lowering medications um, 
mm-hmm. when you're first dealing with this and, and things are just in the beginning. You can reverse diabetes. You can reverse prediabetes. You just have to take charge of your health and your diet and start planning, planning your meals, planning your life in terms of organization. And you can do it. I've turned around hemoglobin A1C, so this is your balance of blood sugar over three months time period. I've turned around ones that are up in 11. That's a high number. Doctors freak. They want to put people on medication. You can turn it around if you have someone who's committed to turning things around. I just turned around a pal of mine's A1C that was at 8 I have another gal in my office who had an 8.2. We turned that around, got her back in a normal range. So don't panic if you go to the doctor and you find that your blood sugar is elevated. They test your hemoglobin A1C. And by the way, if you have any elevated blood sugar ever coming back on your lab test, you want to ask for a hemoglobin A1C test. You want that test. You also want to look at your cholesterol. You want something called a lipoprotein fractionation study. And if you're doing a lab, uh, Cardio IQ is one from Quest Company. If you're looking at LabCorp, they have one that will show you the insulin resistance marker and everything, which is pretty darn cool to be able to tell you, are you struggling with being able to get glucose into your cell because your insulin is resistant to shuttling or ferrying the the glucose into cells for energy. So these are big things to look at. I will have it all written in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. So know that if you are struggling with blood sugar issues, there's plenty of ways to work on it. You just got to be diligent. It can happen and you can keep yourself off of medication for life. You might have to try metformin for a little bit and then switch with berberines and drop off of it, but it can happen. You can do it. And I'm here to say I've done it multiple times for many years for many people and I've done it with myself, even with some blood sugar stuff. And it, it just requires dedication and you can do it because you'll see the results and you'll be like, wow, okay, I can take control of my life. So there you have it. You have survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Kraus here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.